Well, I started in 2000 uh, working in the Ecuadorian Amazon. I didn't realise then what was happening with the oil spills, let alone it was one of the worst oil spills on the planet and the massive Chevron Texaco case. And I kind of just felt that it was Texaco and I had also been responsible. I've driven, I've flown, and so therefore I also need to be a part of the solution. So that was what drove me to feel that I couldn't just walk away from the people. I needed to help them and so that's how you know doing the rainwater systems was something real that that we could do to help out and so every year more or less I build 25 families that are most in need water systems and we've still got the Amazon micro renewal project going with different scientists looking at ways of remediation. So also the crafts here is what supports the indigenous people and so from the sales of these products we're able to build rainwater systems also working with Rainforest Saver on agroforestry to stop the slash and burn of tropical rainforests. It's been good to see these kind of positive steps that we have been taking. Sometimes it feels like only a drop in the ocean, but, you know, every ripple is worth doing. Going by my experience of 18 years working in the Amazon and speaking about the different projects that I've been coordinating, I have seen rivers run black. When I show people the images, it kind of brings it home, not just the effect on the environment, but also on the indigenous people and the children that live there. And do we want that here as well? So on one hand, the government is talking about fossil fuels and climate change and signing the Paris Agreement. But on the other hand, it's not actually doing anything. So it really feels like we really do need to start speaking up and getting involved in all sorts of ways, whether that's legally, politically, as well as direct action. So all parts are needed for us to really stand up. Of course, I have to look at the problems. Really, my focus is the solutions. So the micro-remediation, using fungi to break down oil spills and building rainwater systems and agroforestry to stop the slash and burn. So that's what I always wish to inspire people, to realise that you know one person can make a difference and it takes all of us doing our bit and standing up and speaking out. The government in the UK changed the definition of fracking depending on how much water and pressure is used. In Lancashire we had a famous case of an earthquake which they said was caused by fracking and so they had to stop it. But now, according to the new definition, that would not be a fracked well. So we know that what they are doing is fracking, but under a different name. It's an easy way to divide the people. So when local people say, don't worry, this is not fracking, they feel better about that. No, this is conventional oil and gas drilling. It kind of puts the local people back into a state of apathy. Don't worry, it's just going to be a nodding donkey. We're used to that. There's no problem. But actually, you know, it's the same story, just with a different name. The greatest concern is for the Tagari and the Taramanani, who are two uncontacted tribes. They've made it clear that they never want contact with the outside world. They're the only tribes that we've got down there in that part of the Ecuadorian Amazon which have made that decision. And the government did make an intangible zone, but now the government have sold that off to the Chinese. And so that is our greatest concern for conflict at the moment, between because we know that the Tagari and Taramanani come out with their spears and the oil company have got the military with them. It's not just oil, we've also got a real problem with copper as well. The companies are coming in offering work, and so, of course, some of them are desperate for work, and it's just like, this is a good thing, they're bringing work to our village. And then the other side are saying, yeah, but hang on, we've got clean water at the moment, and, and we don't want to risk that. So there's been a lot of conflict within the communities themselves, and then between different organisations that you know, are speaking up against it and then the indigenous people will say, well, you know, they're not doing enough. The Chevron Texaco case, 30,000 indigenous people trying to get all tribes to agree upon how this case has been going and Chevron have done everything they can to create conflict there. It has divided the people. The other real kind of issue you see a lot down there is there's still absolute abject extreme poverty right next to the oil industry. When the oil industry came to town, everybody thought that, well, it was going to be good, there was going to be money bought in, but over the 18 years of working there, it still absolutely shocks me how some of the villages where I go to build water systems, they don't obviously have water, they don't have power, they don't have toilets, and right next to them is an active oil well. 
last time I was down there, I got so annoyed because these huge trucks were coming down to clean out the wells. The houses were full of dust and the flares in the air, the water, their crops. At the end of a couple of days, I walked down there with the indigenous people and I just said to them, look, it's one thing that you here have water, you have power, you have toilets. And what part of the community relations are you doing? because these people have nothing. And what about you know the dust filling their homes and breathing in from all your equipment? The people have not benefited in any way, shape or form. The Brazilian oil company, Petrobras, they have their own regulations which say that they can't drill in a national park, but they come over to Ecuador and drill in our national parks. Basically, wherever there's oil, there's pollution. You just, and that's the same that's going to happen here, sadly. And we can't seem to learn from others' mistakes. It is a risky business, and it's not rare to have spills. Sometimes it's the indigenous people that are so mad, they'll go and break a pipeline, and then all of a sudden they've contaminated their land even more. Also, a lot of it's just bad practice from the companies themselves. We kind of know that the elephant in the room is climate change, but we all just carry on as normal. And what is it going to take for us to decide that it's time to change? A number of different projects that I've been working on to find solutions to environmental problems such as rubbish and contamination. I think it's really important for us to remember that our every action has a reaction. Everything from when we get that pound in our pocket, who do we decide to give it to? Do we decide to buy coffee that comes from a shade-grown plantation, which means that the forest of diversity is supported? Or or do we buy something because it's cheap and not think about the kind of effects that that has had on the social and environmental world? So I think for people to really start to come aware of you know, their purchase power, what bank they're with, what energy company they're with, how they're supporting the world to move towards the change we want to see. I think they all know, realistically, it's a bit like this dying dragon. We've got this dragon up out of the ground and it just roars. Here we go, we can hear it in a plane above us. It's this constant sound of petroleum. And, and now this dragon is its having its death throes. And they're trying to get out the last drops and they're going to the places where it's harder and harder to get it. We can only burn 30% of the reserves that are left in the ground anyway. What's going to happen to the other 70% of the oil that we just cannot burn because if we did, we would have absolute runaway climate change? I mean, the oil companies know that rising sea levels is caused by them. They will not even discuss climate change. As far as they're concerned, we want it, they're going to supply it to us. We live in a world of supply and demand and all the time that we keep using it, they're just going to keep giving it to us. I think the divest movement, which is very exciting that Ireland has divested, as people start to move their money, as pensions and governments are starting to divest and universities and faith organisations, people are not investing in them. They need a lot of money to operate. That will be the way. They have a legal responsibility to their shareholders to make a profit. I think it's really important to support indigenous communities around the world I mean, these beautiful weavings that um, you know these people are making I mean the art the handicrafts of actually making something with your own hands we are losing that in this world of cheap consumerism where it's everything's made by factory and coming back to really valuing the importance of handicrafts and valuing the communities that make these that's their choice to make something like this and for us to really support them you know continuing with their ancestral heritage and keeping you know the images have significance to them and if we don't support these kinds of projects they'll be lost and once they're lost they're gone forever the same as languages that are being lost in many many indigenous communities around the world and that diversity is so important I have a couple of websites, my name, nicolapeel.com, and also eyesofgaia.com, which is kind of a big environmental portal of a lot of information regarding what's going on and what we can all do.